Hello, I am Sachi Yanari Rizzo, curator of prints and drawings. Every other month, I present a gallery talk virtually and in the Print and Drawing Studies Center. For this season's print room talks, I've been focusing on works by artists from creative families, spouses, siblings, and extended family members. Today, we will look at the lives and art of husband and wife, John and Lynn Bauer. As you may know from our 100th anniversary exhibitions, the Fort Wayne Museum of Art has archives of different artists' works including the Bowers. John and Lynn have graciously agreed to have a conversation with me. They live in a hardwood forest outside Bloomington and have poor internet in service. So we won't be communicating by Zoom. We're pre-recording instead, but they have made up for this by supplying us with plenty of images. Welcome, John and Lynn. First, where did you grow up? And can you talk about your early experiences with art? Thanks, Sachi. I'll go first. I grew up near Lake St. Clair in Gross Point Woods, a suburb of Detroit, with my twin sister. On summer weekends, we spent a lot of time at our family cabin on the Asaba River in northern Michigan. I graduated with honors from high school and from Western Michigan University, where I got a B.S. in art education. I majored in drawing with a minor in graphic design. Actually, I've always liked working in a variety of media. When I was in elementary school, I did this watercolor of a mouse for a cabin, and the block print of the owls is from high school. This woman is from a live drawing class, and the hooked rug is from a textiles class. In my junior year at Western, I was surprised to learn that I did not see in three dimensions, and probably never had. As a result, I underwent eye therapy, which was only partially successful. I have seen mostly in two dimensions ever since, However, I occasionally see in 3D for a while. Then my vision reverts back to 2D. Because most of the time I have two-dimensional vision, I've always seen mostly edges, solid shapes, and outlines, and that's reflected in my artwork. While I can draw shaded figure drawings, to me they're variations of flat tones rather than a recreation of contoured three-dimensional surfaces. I grew up in Lafayette, Indiana with five sisters. As the only boy, I enjoyed creating and building mechanical projects on my own. I made a complex model train layout with plaster of Paris mountains and my own motorized mini bike. Here's a push cart I put together in grade school and the hot rod I built in high school. After high school, I went to nearby Purdue. For graduating, I was awarded a graduate assistantship at Ball State in Muncie. So I have both a BS and an MA degree in industrial education. That's me in the pink tie with some other graduate assistants. The large upholstered fiberglass bowl chair is what I made for a creative project requirement to get my master's degree. This past year, I've been sharing the works of family members, but journals, articles, and books don't necessarily elaborate much on their personal lives. Since we have you here with us today, perhaps you can share some anecdotal stories. Because you two grew up in different states, attended different colleges, and had different life experiences, how did you meet? Well, we each accepted first-year teaching jobs in Kendallville, Indiana. This is the middle school we were assigned to. It had been a high school a few years earlier. And these are the photos of us that were in the yearbook later that year. I moved to Kendallville around the beginning of August and rented half of a new duplex on a cul-de-sac. There were eight double units. About a week after moving in, I was scheduled to attend a meeting with the principal at the school where I'd be teaching. That morning, as I walked out my front door, I heard the door open in the duplex next to mine. I looked over, and I saw a young woman step outside. And that was me. I'd driven down from Kalamazoo that evening before and slept on the floor in my new duplex. I planned on buying a bed after that morning's meeting. As we stopped and looked at each other, we each wondered if we were headed to the same meeting. From the school corporation's letter I'd received, I knew I'd be working with another new teacher. Together, we would be the entire industrial arts department. As I stood there on my stoop, I tentatively asked, Are you Bauer? I couldn't remember his first name. And I said, Yes. Are you Lynn? I couldn't remember her last name of Ruprecht from my version of the same letter. She nodded her head. John offered to drive to the school, so we headed off together in his new, shiny, red MG midget. This was 1972, and we've been together ever since, 50 years now. After our meeting, 
We had lunch at the A&W root beer stand, then drove around on an extended tour of our new town, which we knew very little about. From then on, we drove to school together every day, ate our meals together, and worked on lesson plans together. We shared an office which was between our two classrooms, and team taught some classes. We were always together, which just seemed natural. After three months, we got married over Thanksgiving break. We spent a brief honeymoon at the French Lake Hotel, which was pretty shabby back then. It was a huge, old, ornate building. It was a bit threadbare in places. I was hired to teach crafts and John industrial arts. After a year, we decided we couldn't repeat the same curriculum over and over again. We had several classes that required the same lessons. Then at mid-year, we got all new students and we taught those same lessons again. For us, it was hard to keep doing the same thing over and over. Even though the kids, the school, the community, and the principal were really great, and we enjoyed that year, we just had to move on. We were young and curious and eager to see and do new things, so we moved to North Carolina. John worked as a design draftsman for a company that made retail store fixtures, and I worked in a downtown women's shoe store as a manager, salesperson, and window display designer. We also both freelance for a local graphic design firm. But the South, back in that era, just wasn't for us. So we moved to Fort Wayne, where I became a design draftsman at Magnavox. Lynn got a job designing displays for a local chain of women's clothing stores. Next, we moved to Lafayette, where we bought a solid but neglected 1850s-era federal-style house. It was pretty dumpy and needed extensive updating, which we did all ourselves. John worked on the house evenings and weekends. For me, it was my full-time job. And it really was a lot of work. We made new windows, replaced a lot of the siding, and redid almost everything inside and out. During regular working hours, I was a design draftsman for an environmental engineering firm. After a few years, our home won a restoration award from the local historical society. Unfortunately, by then, Lynn had paid a steep price for our home's makeover. I lived and I worked 24-7 around new building materials, such as carpeting, vinyl, paint, stain, caulking, and cabinetry. I usually wore a pretty good dust mask, but most of these things outgassed chemicals, including formaldehyde. I also had a part-time business doing furniture stripping and refinishing, which exposed me to even more chemicals and solvents. At the time, there was very little information about exposure to such chemicals, but we soon learned some of the consequences. I had trouble breathing and my health went downhill. I became sensitive to tiny amounts of everyday exposures. Besides odorous building materials, I became sensitive to cleaning products, fragrant soaps and detergents, synthetic clothing and printing ink, and a lot more. For a while, I could draw with pen and ink, use oil paints and pastel pencils, and I did simple weavings on a small loom. But I soon became sensitive to most art materials and synthetic yarns. I was in pretty bad shape back then. After Lynn became ill from all the toxic chemicals and furnishings she was exposed to, we tried to find information on what was going on and how we could improve her health. But there was almost nothing out there. What we did find, though, was a national organization for chemically sensitive individuals. It was called the Human Ecology Action League, or HEAL for short. After a while, we became editors of its Indiana Chapters newsletter. Back then, the condition was known as environmental illness but today most people call it multiple chemical sensitivity. In order for Lynn to regain her health, we sold our house and moved to some wooded land near Bloomington. Then I started writing some articles about the negative health effects of common building materials and alternative healthier choices. One day Lynn said, you know, you should write a book about all this. Of course she was right, so I did. It was titled The Healthy House and it was accepted by a New York publisher. This all happened while I was building our own healthy house. That book eventually led to a completely new life for us. After a second edition came out, Lynn and I formed our own publishing company and started writing more books. Some were by me, some by Lynn. Mine dealt with different aspects of building the structure of a healthy house. And mine were about things that go inside the house. They were filled with safer, less toxic choices for everything from furniture to bedding to cleaning products. 
even makeup and appliances. We also wrote one book together and produced several videos. Eventually, I built five healthy houses by myself, and I was a regular speaker at national building conferences. I also did quite a few radio and TV interviews, and did some consulting with people who wanted to improve their unhealthy houses. I don't think many of us comprehend how toxic these everyday materials can be. I find it fascinating how artists adapt to different changes in their lives, in Lynn's case, her health, and yet continue to make art. When I've when I visited your Bloomington home, you showed me an ingenious desk that John designed and built. Can you share this with us? Yeah, it's called a reading box and it's similar to a laboratory fume hood, but more residential. Basically, it's a wooden box with a glass top. There's a curtain over an opening in the front so I can put my hands inside. And it has a fan that pulls air past the curtain, which blows air through an activated carbon filter before it heads back into the room. It lets me work with some materials inside the box that might otherwise have bothered me. During this time, I was too ill to do very much, but after we moved into our own healthy house, I slowly started to improve and was able to do a series of pencil drawings. Because regular pencils smell of cedar and most papers have been made using a variety of chemicals, I used a mechanical pencil and 100% cotton rag paper. We continued to work in the healthy house field to learn how Lynn's health could be even better. By the time she was getting stronger, we'd written about a million words on the subject and were getting antsy to move on to something new. For me, that was photography. Were you always interested in photography? Did you receive formal training and have any special mentors? When I was about 10 years old, my grandmother gave me her old box camera. It was probably made in the 1920s. I used it to shoot all kinds of subjects, but mostly friends and relatives, a few objects around the house. After I had my film developed, many of the images were blurry, and most just weren't very good. One that I did like shows my dad and one of my sisters. They're standing in front of his typewriter shop, and he's holding her hand. Several years ago, I made an enlargement and hand-colored it for her 60th birthday. I had an uncle and an older cousin who were amateur photographers, but they both lived several hours away, so there just wasn't anyone nearby who was into photography. No one even to show me how to properly hold a camera and press the shutter so it wouldn't shake. When I went to Purdue, I asked in the art department if I could take a photography course. Since I wasn't an art major, that didn't work out. But in my industrial education major, I did take some graphic arts courses. These included darkroom work for making printing plates and photo silk screens. I enjoyed that a lot, but there was no real camera work. When I got to Ball State, a friend had a darkroom set up in his bedroom. He had an enlarger squeezed between his clothes in the closet and lined up developing trays on top of his dresser. I was able to borrow a camera and he let me use his setup to develop film and make prints. What kinds of things did you shoot back then, and when did you get serious about photography? Well, that was the early 70s, and a lot of people were experimenting with various types of print manipulation, such as solarization. That's where you flash a light on in the darkroom during the developing process, and you get an image that looks like a cross between a negative and a positive. I played around with that. It was pretty experimental, so some prints came out better than others. During that time, I was mostly into weird darkroom techniques, rather than learning about composition. I also did some posterization in a special problems in graphic arts class. I separated images into two or three high contrast black and white negatives. Then I printed them in colors on a lithographic offset printing press. Again, they had a 1960s, 70s vibe to them. It wasn't until I was in my early 50s that I got serious about photography. Because I'd always wanted to take a class, but had never done so, I decided it was high time to do it. So I signed up for one at our local art center. It was basic, mostly about developing film correctly and making prints in a dark room, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. So much so, not long after the end of the course, I built a professional grade traditional dark room in our house. I really liked the hands on nature of working in a dark room, so while well, many people were switching from film to digital, I was able to buy some great equipment at really affordable prices. 
and that one course was all your formal training. That's really impressive. Please tell us about the type of camera you use and any special techniques. As far as formal training, that was it. But Lynn and I are big fans of used book sales. So I started buying all sorts of photography books. I picked up ones covering technique, composition, and history, as well as monographs and biographies. Right now I have over 500 titles and I've read and studied most of them. So in actuality, all those authors have taught me a great deal. I started out with a Mamiya 645 medium format camera, produced negatives that were 60 millimeters by 45 millimeters. That's roughly two and a quarter by one and three quarter inches. After several years, I got a Mamiya 67, which makes negatives almost as big as a playing card. It allows me to get bigger enlargements without losing any quality. I always use a tripod with a shutter release cable. That way I can get the sharpest negatives possible. And I often use what's called a shift lens. It's also called a perspective control lens. Because I used to be a draftsman, I like 90 degree angles and parallel lines. So I often want my subjects to be squared up with their lines parallel to the edges of the print. This image shows the front of the lens shifted up as far as it'll go. What this lens does is allow me to change the perspective of what I'm photographing. For example, if you take any camera and point it up at a building, because of the perspective, you'll see the sides of the building tapering inward toward the top. But in some instances, that's not what I want. By adjusting the shift lens, I can distort the image in the viewfinder and on the film to make the sides of the building parallel to the edges of the frame. Actually, in this case, I preferred the first image, which emphasizes the height. But this is a shot where I did change the perspective to square up the image. By the way, these were taken at an abandoned Methodist church in downtown Gary. It's a really popular place for photographers who like to shoot urban decay. John's often asked about using color film. And my reply is that some people like working with oil paint, others watercolor. It's similar with film. I've seen some amazing color images, but for me, I like the stark, moody energy of black and white. And I'm pretty meticulous in a dark room. Ansel Adams developed a process he called the zone system, which produces the highest quality negatives and prints possible. I use a modified version of his techniques, so I regularly manipulate brightness, darkness, and contrast in the dark room to get the effects I'm after. And I'm mostly drawn to decrepitude. The subtitle of my first photography book contains the phrase, fading, forlorn, and forgotten places. I like to find the beauty in objects and buildings that have been cast aside. They reflect the reality of a past that's fading away. I really believe that most of my photographs have a story to tell. But because so many places I shoot are abandoned, there's nobody around to tell those stories. Well, sometimes I think I can almost hear the voices from their pasts. When we're out exploring, Lynn is very much a partner in the process. She'll scour the countryside looking for subjects, while I keep my eye on the road. When we stop somewhere, she'll look for detail shots, or position a reflector if I need one. She also makes detailed notes about each shot, which includes the date, location, and any information gleaned from neighbors. So your work is very collaborative and you've apparently covered a lot of miles. You told me once that you have driven about 130,000 miles exploring Indiana, visiting every city and town in the state. You've also published seven photograph books. Do you have future books and projects you would like to pursue? We actually have two new ones that are virtually complete. They only need a few refinements before they're ready to print. But we're both in our 70s now, and we'd rather give a conventional publishing company the responsibility of marketing them. It's now time for us to move on to other endeavors. After John built his darkroom, I started doing drawings on my computer with a pressure-sensitive drawing tablet. While I have regained much of my health, I still can't tolerate many art materials, so the computer allows me to work with all sorts of media effects. And we work together here, too. John often has suggestions while I'm drawing. In fact, he named this one Mermaids Taking a Break from Luring Sailors to Their Deaths. I have no problem tolerating metal, which is fairly inert. 
So I've created some sculptures using copper and aluminum sheets. One of my favorites is a dragon, which we have hanging above our bathtub. Another is a mobile of a group of panic crows. My inspiration for this one came from Alexander Calder. Actually, we each have projects underway almost every day. At this point in our lives, we're fortunate we don't have to be concerned about bringing in cash. We're able to do things we love without worrying about how it can generate an income. For example, we collect vintage postcards, most of which were made in the first half of the 20th century. This one is from a, one of our largest collections, the 1933 Chicago World's Fair, which was an amazing exposition. And we create our own albums for the cards. The front matter usually contains several thousand words of carefully researched introductory material, and the pages with cards all have descriptive captions. Lynn handles most of the design work and the layout for the albums, and she's as meticulous with them as she is with all our books. Everything's done with great care, choosing borders, colors, dingbats, fonts, paragraph spacing, and so on. She'll lay out all the postcards on the desks and countertops in her office, then arrange and shuffle them until pairs look good together on a page, and one page follows the next in a visually pleasing manner. Our albums are essentially one-of-a-kind books, and Indiana University's rare book library, the Lilly Library, has already agreed to accept them through our wills. And Lynn has an amazing collection of ethnic dolls. Most of them are handmade and quite old. I didn't play with dolls as a girl, but I did buy a small Indian doll in northern Michigan with my allowance, and I've always treasured her. With a bow and quiver full of arrows and dressed in leather clothes, she's very down to earth and has a natural beauty. Not many years ago, I picked up several ethnic dolls at a local rummage sale. They are the type of souvenirs that tourists would have brought home in years past. Some were quite tattered, so I carefully restored them. Those first few led me to look for more. Today, I own over 80, and they've all been carefully restored. Most are small, 4 inches to 10 inches tall. But my latest is on the right. She's a large, ornately beaded and beautifully dressed Navajo doll, about 17 inches tall. She came with an arm falling off, missing beads, a lot of hair loss, both hands were gone, and only half of her skirt was still there. It took weeks to bring her back to life. Do the two of you have any further thoughts about your art? My photography has allowed me to preserve on film structures and places that are now gone forever. These were places that were important to the generations who came before us. Then they became obsolete and were eventually abandoned, ignored, forgotten, or dismissed. Yet they're a huge part of our collective everyday history. So for me, they need to be appreciated and not just in mere snapshots. That's why I honor and preserve them in carefully crafted portraits. In my pen and ink drawings, I do older people doing things that seem amusing, but they offer more than humor. I love the fact these individuals are comfortable just being themselves. They have no pretensions, cover-ups, deceptions, excuses, or explanations. They are simply who they are. I find that refreshing, courageous, and deeply meaningful. Back Home Magazine liked them so much, they commissioned me to draw their first four covers in pen and ink. My pencil drawings of humanoid animals also convey whimsy and humor, but they also depict individuals who are simply being themselves. They may be flawed and out of step, but they're still moving down life's path, just like the rest of us. We all sometimes feel shame at not attaining the perfection that society seems to demand of us. But life's most important lesson is to be yourself, proudly but humbly, warts and all. Lynn, I think these are my favorite of yours. There are so many small details to catch that poke fun at humanity. I really admire your desire to continue creating art and not letting your health hold you back. And John, there is a, such a beautiful, bittersweet quality to your photographs as many of these structures continue to degrade or no longer exist. Well, thank you, John and Lynn, for sharing yourselves and your art with the Fort Wayne Museum of Art and our patrons. You're very welcome, Sachi. And thank you for inviting us to share.